Good afternoon. First, I want to start my story today by sharing some photos of my family training for martial arts. This is my seven-year-old Haley, and here is my five-year-old Chloe. So we are learning at this dojo for about four months now, and it is a mixture of Kung Fu, Krav Maga, and kickboxing. Uh, we finally got our yellow belts right before the holidays, and it is a lot of fun. It's healthy, it's good for you, and we are loving it. Although martial arts is a lot of fun, but the reason why we started, started training, it is not that fun. It was mainly because of the increased Asian hate crimes since the beginning of the pandemic. As you can see in the graph on the left-hand side, the hate crimes against Asian Americans have increased in exponentially. And what really scared me was that many of the times it was targeting women and the elderly. So the ones that were considered as more vulnerable and physically weaker to protect themselves were being targeted. I got really distressed, depressed, and most of all, really sad. It got really bad that I was afraid to go outside and take a short walk around our house or going to the grocery shopping. And I thought that I don't want to live in fear anymore. Yes, it is a real phenomena and a real problem. And there are a lot of things that I cannot control. And what I wanted to do was something that I can control that's good for me and good for my family. So in reality, after some research, I reached the conclusion that the best thing to do if there's an aggressor on the street is actually to run and get out of the place as soon as possible. I hope it will not happen to me or anybody else. But I also hope that the skills that I have learned, I have been learning might be useful Today, I want to share my story of an Asian scholar and a person. So the huge turning point in my life was when, when my family immigrated from South Korea to Canada when I was 14. We landed in Vancouver, Canada, which is breathtakingly beautiful. And I was also impressed by the fact that many Canadians take such a pride over the fact that it is, its society is a cultural mosaic which celebrates diversity. And oftentimes they were comparing themselves with the melting pot model of the US. However, I was sometimes very bothered or confused by some of the comments that, that I received or when I observed these interracial, interethnic interactions. At that time, I didn't know what racism is. So when I asked my family or friends about it, their response was just to ignore it or forget about it, that I was being overly sensitive. So unless I hear these comments like, go back to your country, you ching ching chong, um, they told me that it's not really racism. My, my parents also told me to just study hard, get good grades, master the English language, and after five years, I can get the Canadian citizenship, and I will be a real Canadian by then. That's exactly what I did. I studied hard, got good grades, and semi-mastered the English language, got the Canadian citizenship, but I still didn't feel like I really belonged in the society. And when I observed how my Korean Canadian friends are like, so they are second generation immigrants who were born and raised in Canada, who were considered themselves as Canadians, were getting comments and questions such as, where are you from? where are you really from, or your English is very good, meaning that you're not one of us, you're not real Canadian because you're of your race. I was really confused, but still there were no answers, so I just kept on with my life. And it was when I was pursuing my master's degree in social work at Columbia University, I first learned the terminology racial microaggressions, Right now, it is, it is a lot more common and widely known, but it was 12 years ago, and it was such an aha moment for me. It really answered a lot of questions that I had, why I was so bothered, frustrated, and confused for more than 10 years. 
So when I started my PhD program, I ventured out and I was able to embark my journey as an Asian scholar studying the phenomena of racial microaggressions and Asian immigrants' well-being, studying the phenomena scientifically and empirically, and it was the most meaning, meaningful part of my journey as a scholar. Now, I want to share the major take-home points from the studies that were conducted on racism, racial microaggressions on Asian immigrants or Asian Americans' well-being, mainly from my own studies, but also from other literature. First and foremost, racial microaggressions is real. It has tangible effects and, and it has real detrimental effects on the individuals psychologically, mentally, and also physically. So if you experience racial microaggressions, you are more likely to be distressed, depressed, hopeless, sad, have a lower self-esteem and lower sense of belonging, and you are more likely to have hypertension and more lower immune system. And also, even if the terminology has the word micro, it doesn't really mean that the consequence is micro as well. In fact, the effects of microaggressions is quite macro and both short-term and long-term effects there are. If you are left with confused feelings questioning whether it was really racism or not, it is actually draining your cognitive ability, which you could have used something else, something productive. Second of all, despite of all the detrimental effects of racism, Asian immigrants were trying to combat the negative impact by engaging in various coping mechanisms. For example, they were utilizing social support by talking to their friends and family members or trying to develop their ethnic identity, which might buffer the negative effects of racism. Sometimes they engaged in active coping, but other times they decided not to do anything about it. So in order to cope against racism, it doesn't mean that you have to always be the fighter. If you know that was racism and you can choose to do something or not to do anything about it, that's your choice and it is totally fine. Third of all, despite their efforts to combat racism, Asian or Korean immigrants' level of awareness or knowledge about systematic racism is actually lower compared to other minority individuals. Just anecdotally, I was surprised when I talked to Korean immigrants since the beginning of the pandemic because many of them were shocked and confused that there's such a thing as racism against Asian Americans. These are immigrants who have lived in the United States for more than a decade or even two, 20 years. And they said that they had never experienced racism before until now. So this lack of understanding or awareness become, could become their vulnerability when they are faced with racism. They don't know what to do. They don't know how to help themselves or their children if they experience racism at the school or in the community um, and if they are parents. Now I want to end my story today by sharing where I am currently at personally and also professionally. Per personally, I find myself being more resilient and empowered compared to the beginning of the pandem pandemic. Um, I'm not afraid of going for a walk or meet new people, and my family are still training for martial arts. We are working hard to get the orange belt now. We also talk about the difficult topics such as racism, racial differences, and the discrimination with our kids in, in their age-appropriate ways. Professionally, I will keep researching about the Asian immigrants' experiences of racial microaggressions, but with a newer focus, I want to contribute my research to do more hands-on interventions to increase the Asian immigrant family's resiliency against the racism so that their cultural humility is higher, their level of awareness of systematic race racism in the U.S. is higher, and they have more coping mechanisms and strategies. So basically, I want to see more Asian families being resilient and empowered. Thank you for listening to my story. Thank you.